Welcome, everybody. Um, Ted's not here. I, I, has anybody heard about how his wife's surgery went yesterday? It was, it was supposed to have gone well. They were, uh, they think they got all the cancer and everything. They, they did biopsies, and uh, you know, so they'll follow up with that. And uh, you spent the night there at the hospital, and it, when today, if every if they're all systems are go, she'll come home today. Okay. Great. Great. That's great. Yeah. All our thoughts and prayers <laughs> with Ted and Cheryl. Uh, today we have an interesting uh, topic: a tale of four cities uh, instead of two cities. And the speaker, Phil Duffy, has become an economic historian, I suppose. And he's going to talk about uh, a gentleman probably none of us have ever heard of, named Cantillon, who. Maybe was the first free market economist back 300 years ago. And he's going to discuss how his work was suppressed by, surprisingly enough, Adam Smith, and how that led into um, Marxism and National Socialism and whatever. So this could be a very interesting topic. Um, please hold your rotten tomatoes to the end of the show. <laughs> We'll probably have plenty of questions for Phil. So, uh, Phil's spoken to us a number, a number of times before, and um, Phil, the floor is yours for the next uh, hour. Thank you. I'm going to move through this relatively quickly because I understand that uh, you know 11 o'clock is a, a serious time. So, getting right into this. Uh, the storyline begins in Ballyhay County, Kerry, Ireland, and it initially focuses on a Norman Irishman, Richard Canlon, who was forced to leave the land of his ancestors called home. He becomes a successful banker in Paris, then London, avoids two financial bubbles. Will this do better? Yeah. 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 All right. Let me put this over here. Okay, uh, he avoids two financial bubbles. We'll talk about those in the early 18th century. And he writes the first text on uh, modern economics four decades before Adam Smith. And Smith then suppresses his work, allowing Engels and Marx to describe an alternative view of human progress. Okay, that's that's the start. Now, we're going to be exposed to a lot of ideas, events, and so forth. And if you're not confused when you leave here, you don't understand. <laughs> I'm going to use an analogy. Um, basic fabric. History is fabric. Uh, terms that are used are the warp and the weft. And uh, let's take a look at the weft first. This is about entrepreneurship and human progress, the irrelevance of economic class, free trade versus mercantilism, market spontaneity versus central planning, true wealth as opposed to money, clarification of labels, and multiple realms of human action. It's not just about economics. It's not just about the law. It's also other realms of human action. And I'm talking about the book now in, in its entirety because you won't get this, this feel from, uh, from the presentation here today. But basically, it has to do with charity, civility, mercy, and a number of other things. Economics and the law fit within a, a total picture. We can't ignore the rest of that. We can't cover it in very much detail either today. OK, one term that comes up over and over again, and, and what I'm going to try to convince you about today is that even though you come up with a definition of mercantilism, it never is broad, broad enough. Mercantilism, which reached its height in the year 17th and 18th centuries with the system of statism, which employed economic fallacy to build up the structure of imperial state power, as well as special subsidy and monopolistic privilege to individuals or groups favored by the state. 
great broad definition, but not broad enough. You know, we're going to see lots of different variations on this. Okay, this is where things start. Uh, beautiful area, Valley Haig. Uh, and it's, Valley Haig is on the west coast of Ireland. Now, you've noticed the name Cantillon, and it doesn't sound Irish at all. It wasn't. Uh, the Battle of Hastings brought the Normans into Britain in 1066. What most people don't realize is a century later, the same thing happened in Ireland. Okay, and it's interesting. First, there's the devastation. Then they decided, well, let's get all everybody together. And we see here the marriage of the Norman Lord Strongbow to the Irish princess. And I can't even pronounce that. But the basic idea is, you know, let's live together, get along. And so the Norman, the Normans really become Gallicized, if you will. They become Irish. But then later, and here we have the Protestant part of the thing, uh, things break up for this, this Cantillon family, which was, they, they would be the feudal barons, if you will. Not quite barons, but nonetheless, you know, they're a part of the elite. And there's a massacre at Grada under Cromwell. And then kind of later on, after the, the Glorious Revolution, the so-called Bloodless Resolution, uh, Revolution in England, um, not so bloodless in, in Ireland. And finally, James II uh, loses the Battle of Boyne in 1690. Now, notice that date, 1690. Dates are going to be important here. Simultaneously, we have Louis XIV, who was, you know, I am the state, famously. He really didn't say it, but uh, he lived that, that life. He, uh, he died in 1715. And his reign was characterized by wars. And uh, the last was the War of the Spanish uh, Succession in 1714. But he had another side to him, which was luxury. But how do you pay for all of this? Well, he had a fellow by the name of Jean Baptiste Colbert. And he's famous for the art of taxation consists in so plucking the goose as to obtain the largest amount of feathers with the smallest amount of hissing. <laughs> so France is the largest nation in Europe, really. You know, it, it combined early. And um, the French Revolution that comes later is a result of, of Louis XIV and subsequent actions by by the monarchy and the aristocracy. Now, Jean Baptiste Colbert was revered by Alexander Hamilton. Okay. We have some dirt in our past, too. Okay, so what are you going to do on, in 1715? You've got a youngster, I think he's about five years old, uh, Louis XV, who really couldn't reign, but he was the king. So you have a regency. And so they meet in the uh, Palais Royal to put together a plan to, you know, pull the nation out of financial chaos that was uh, created. And Philippe II, Duke of Orleans, was the Regent of France. And we have this fellow on the right here, John Law. Now you've heard of John Law, but it's not the same John Law. This John Law is a Scot. Um, he, he earned his money the hard way. He inherited it. <laughs> and then he attempted to augment it by uh, gambling. He really understood probabilities. And so he did very well. Um, but then he had a little problem with a woman, got into a duel, had to leave England in a hurry. And he goes over to France. And of course, he meets up with the royalty and all the, the hot shots over there over the gambling tables. And he has this scheme, create paper money, paper paper money as well. And so here's the evolution of what is called the Mississippi scheme. 1716, he's appointed controller general of finances and a bank general privé, a private bank like our, our federal reserve system Wait a second. Maybe I lied to you. Uh, first, they issued paper money. And three quarters of the capital consisted of government bills and government accepted notes. 
you'll see a pattern here over and over again. 1717, Law bought the Mississippi Company to help a uh, French colony in Louisiana. In the same year, Law conceived a joint, joint uh, stock company called Compagnie de Occident, or the Mississippi Company. Um, and basically, Law was named the chief director of this new company, which was granted a trade monopoly. Here's another pattern, okay, of the West Indies in North America by the French government. And in 18, 1718, the bank became Bank Royale, and now it's incorporated into the French government as a, an integral part of the, uh, of the government itself. And the bank began issuing more notes than it could represent in coinage, and this led to a currency devaluation, which was eventually followed by a bank run when the value of the new paper currency was halved. It gets worse. 1718, the key to the Bank Royale agreement was that the national debt would be paid from revenues derived from opening the Mississippi Valley. There's gold in those streets, according to that time. Only 700 Europeans were in Louisiana. And so what we see, this is the backing of all of this paper. All the wealth that's going to be created by these 700 people. And this is what that, that territory looked like. It's the, the bottom area there, Louisiana. Um, <clears throat> very undeveloped. Now, law exaggerated the wealth of Louisiana with an effective marketing scheme which led to wild speculation of shares of the company. And the scheme promised success for the Mississippi company by combining investor fervor and the wealth of its Louisiana pr uh, prospects into a sustainable joint stock trading company. And so, you know, we're off to the races here. Uh, we've seen stock market uh, uh, in, in increases very significant over the, the past decade. Same thing's going on here. The market price of the company's shares eventually reached the peak of 10,000 Libra. As the shareholders were selling their shares, the money supply in France suddenly doubled and the inflation took off. Inflation reached a monthly rate of 23% in January. 23%. Uh, we don't understand inflation, trust me. The end stage is very brutal and, and uncontrollable. And then the bubble burst at the end of 1720. And by 1721, share prices had dropped to 500 Libra. So, um, of course, uh, uh, the Duke of Orleans dismissed law. Uh, law then fled to Fran from France to Brussels, eventually moving to uh, Venice, uh, where he lived off of his gambling. Venice is a very appropriate ending spot for him because he was below water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, uh, there's a book called uh, uh, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And it I, it talks about these three bubbles. And there is a, a uh, statement, a quote by Bernard Baruch out of that. And it, it's a quote of Friedrich Sch uh, Schiller. And it says, anyone taken as an individual is tolerably sensible and reasonable. As a member of a crowd, he is at once, he at once becomes a blockhead. <laughs> and that's a theme that you're gonna see throughout <clears throat> all of this. Now these themes was the tulip mania, which ended in 1637, the Mississippi scheme, which we just talked about, and the British had to get into it with their own South Sea bubble, which we'll talk about in a minute, at some, uh, 1720. Now, this is interesting because in France, um, very close to Holland, uh, they would be very familiar with the, the tulip mania. It's only 80 years that elapses here and everything is forgotten. So we are not the only ones who forget and ignore our history. If this is a worldwide type of thing, <clears throat> you know, almost like the buffalo being stampeded over the, the, the cliff. It happens over and over and over again. And we may very well be in a similar situation ourselves right now. And it's not just the United States, it's worldwide. Okay, now the British are looking over at the successful phase of this thing, 
And they're saying, we got to get into that action. And so you had the South Sea Company and the South Sea Bubble. And the South Sea is not Polynesia. It's the area in the Caribbean that you see here. This is the, the shield of the company. Founded in 1711 as a public-private partnership. Public-private partnership. Remember mercantilism? Okay. Uh, to consolidate government debt. Have you heard that theme before? To generate income in 1713, the company was granted a monopoly to supply African slaves to the Caribbean islands. Not a nice bunch of guys, the, these people who put together these schemes. Never realizing a significant profit from the trade with the company, shares <clears throat> increased greatly in value as it expanded its operations dealing in government debt and uh, peaked in 1720 before suddenly collapsing. Here's another theme over and over again, and we see it today. You know, do we have Wall Street banks who are involved in this very type of thing? 1718, a war of the quadruple alliance broke out with Spain, and this they thought they were going to cooperate with Spain. Didn't happen, and the company's assets were seized. So they were really on the edge here. The company was then granted the right to issue uh, one, I think, one 1150, uh, that million is long, I think, um, of new stock for every 100 per annum of annuity, which was surrendered. In other words, think of that as a ratio and all the paper that is being uh, thrown into the economy. 1720 estimated uh, one too many bribes, just too many bribes uh, to ministers, members of parliament and courtiers for additional swapping of government debt for equity in exchange for company share. This is getting pretty complicated here. And this is as simple as I can make it. Uh, plans were made for a new scheme to take over most of the unconsolidated uh, debt, it's 30 million pounds, 31 million pounds almost, in exchange for company shares. Here we go again. And uh, curiously, this is all done within this place called Dividend Hall of the South Sea Company. Yeah, they're going to distribute the dividends. In the final stage here of acquiring this debt and, and getting the government, uh, pulling the government's chestnuts out of the fire, they had 18.3 million pounds held by three public private uh, partnerships. Mercantilism again, public private. Uh, 3.4 by the Bank of England, 3.2 by the East India Company, company and 11.7 by the South Sea Company. So we had plenty of people to promote this idea. 11.7 million were probably uh, privately held redeemable debt. In other words, it's short-term debt and they have to figure out some way to pay it off. And so, hey, these people come along with a scheme, let's do it. And 15 million was longer term debt. So the Parliament encouraged a bidding war between the Bank of England and South Sea Company. So the shares go up in price. Insiders, including King George I and his girlfriend, were rewarded with opportunities to buy company shares at issuance price. The company hyped the stock with extravagant rumors of the new world trade potential. Where have we heard that before? The Mississippi scheme. <clears throat> and the share price rose from 128 pounds to 550 pounds in May. And the South Sea Bubble Act, they actually passed a South Sea Bubble Act to keep everybody out, else out of the business. So the only shares that you could buy <clears throat> in the stock exchange were the South Sea Company. Okay? And the company's share price went to 1,000 pounds. Now, of course, all of this finally uh, is, is imploding. So we have to look at the symbols in the company shield to see really what's going on here. First of all, the trade part of it uh, is virtually no trade, nothing to back up, no security behind all of this paper. Now, the, the insiders, and including the royalty, they get their share unless they're stupid enough to stay in too long. What are you left with? 
two rotten fish. <laughs> okay, this is what the spike looks like. And you can see it's very short lived. 1720, wow. way up, way down. So let's ponder uh, some of the questions that are involved. Who bails out whom in these situations? A little confusing. Who wins and who loses? Well, we know who loses. People who, who left the game last, they're the losers. Uh, what are the dimensions of mercantilism? Well, does it matter whether fiat money is created through the front side or back door? Um, front door would be the nation's treasury. That's too obvious. I'm not going to do that. Side door would be the nation's central bank. Are we doing that right now? The back door is a public-private partnership like the South Sea Company. And yes, they produce these slips of paper which pass as money in the, uh, the economy of Great Britain. I'm going to take you off on another connection because we are related to this through uh, Benjamin Franklin. He was an apprentice to his older brother, James, and his older brother wanted to uh, create a new uh, sensational uh, uh, newspaper called the New England Current. And he was waiting for the opportunity to, to get started. 1721, he gets the news from England, and he understands what's going on with South Sea Company, that there is a bubble. And so that launches the New England Current. That launches Benjamin Franklin as an author. And later on, Franklin is involved with all the major uh, parties in uh, in of uh, uh, Europe, uh, both on the English side and on the French side. And he turns out to be pretty much a free market guy. Now, let's get back to Richard Cantillon. How did he benefit from the financial bubbles? First, he was a, a partner of John Wall. So he got in on the, the upswing, but he got out early. He cashed out. He loaned money to law and others at significant interest rates, I think somewhere up around 40%. Oh, can, can, you, can you imagine a people buying it? I mean, have you seen this kind of behavior in the current uh, situation here? Uh, he, he shorted both stocks of the companies and their nation's currencies simultaneously. Adam Smith. So we're going to start to compare the two. Notice the dates here. Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790. Richard Cantillon, 1680, somewhere to 1734. Incidentally, he's the only economist to have been murdered. Very mysterious guy. Uh, OK, those dates are important because Smith has the benefit of the experience that Cantillon did not have. Cantillon's coming out of the feudal age. He's got to interpret the signals. Smith, on the other hand, can take all of the, the opportunities that had come in a very short period of time in the early uh, 18th century. And we'll talk about some of those. So here are their two major um, uh, books on the subject of economics. And these are considered modern economics texts. The one on the left is four decades before Adam Smith gets started. Okay, so did Adam Smith have access to Cantillon? He refers to him once and puts him down. Something else is going on here that's very big, called the British Agricultural Revolution. We had, you know, for hundreds of years, the feudal system. Now suddenly inventions are starting to have an impact on agriculture, specifically Jethro Tull and seed drill. Now you have greater productivity of the land. That's great for some people and it's bad for others because now we're starting to build the unemployed class, if you will. In addition, you have something called the Norfolk, uh, Norfolk four core system of crop rotation. Um, Basically, crops had you had to have one field that was fallow for every, I think, three other fields that you were planting. And a fellow by the name of Townsend comes along 
Viscount Townsend. And he says, no, you don't need to do that. If you plant these four crops, you can keep everything productive because the cycle itself will refresh the earth. And these are just two examples, but they are major, major, they have a major impact. Unless you have the British uh, agricultural revolution, you cannot have the industrial revolution. You have to free people from the land, land to be part of the factory system. Also, another force, oceanic sailing. We're transitioning through a period in which you have these square rigged uh, ships, and they're great when they're being driven before the wind. But the problem, and that creates a, th a three way trade, by the way. Um, you start out in, in uh, Europe, you go south to the Canary Current, then you get to the North Equatorial Current, you pick up the Gulf Stream and go back. And in the meantime, you hit the West Coast, pick up uh, African slaves, take them to the, uh, the colonies where they can raise the sugar and, and the molasses and so forth. And you start to sell the stuff and pick up other crops and finally you go back. Well, that's great. But on the other hand, it can be slow. You're dependent upon the winds and it's not very direct. That's the one route that, that you really have. When you change the sail plan, you can point your sailing ships closer into the wind and you have all kinds of, of opportunities for trade. And that's what's called a routine sail. If you look at, at ships in the later part of the 18th century, what you'll see is they're just loaded with these routine uh, sails in addition to the, the uh, flat sails. Okay, returning to the main theme of the, of the tale, um, what is it that Candelon was talking about? What did he discover? We're not gonna talk about the whole thing, we're going to talk a little bit about a conceptual. This is the, the deepest we'll get into economics here, I think. The idea of the, the four contributors to the, with the four factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. And this is a relatively minor, um, a modern concept. Uh, and each of these is associated with a so-called economic payment, rent, wages, interest, and profit. And this is interesting because it shifts over time. First of all, Richard Candelon, who's the, one of the greatest bankers of all time, certainly knew the capital market. He ignored it in his book called The Essay on Trade in General. Very curious, and maybe it's because he wanted to put a lot of uh, emphasis on entrepreneurship and how entrepreneurship is really the driver of human progress. So there's a fellow uh, on the French side, A.R.J. Turgot, who filled in the capital part of it. And so the four factors of production were uh, aware, they were made aware uh, to Adam Smith. He knew about the four factors. Here's the interesting part. He drops off entrepreneurship, basically saying it's unimportant. Specifically, the produce of labor constitutes the natural recompense or wages of labor. Yeah, we could, we could accept that. As soon as land becomes private property, the landlord demands a share of almost all the produce which the laborer can either raise or collect from it. His rent makes the first deduction, the first deduction um, <clears throat> from the produce of the labor which is employed upon land. In other words, he's suggesting that the, the landlord is really not necessary. Everything is produced by labor. The entrepreneur has no role. It all happens spontaneously and magically. And now listen to the last one. Profit makes a second deduction from the produce of the labor, which is employed upon land. Wow. And Engels and Marx take that whole concept and reduce it now from those four factors down to two. They say, well, the landlords and the, uh, the bourgeoisie, the people who were 
you know, running the shops and all the rest of that, they're, they're all together against the proletariat. This is the class idea of Marxism. The basis for the violent, the violent uh, uh, contest between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And who is going to win in that contest? It's inevitable that the proletariat will win. Well, not quite. We're going to have a couple of bourgeoisie who are going to lead it. The name of Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx. They were not. They were not workers. They were bourgeoisie. Another thing that <clears throat> Adam Smith got wrong, or something supply and demand. Now, here's an example. What is the price of water in the rainforest? You just dip it in a bucket, take out what you want. It's costless. What is the price of water in the desert? Well, you may have to pay a little bit if you need it. And here's a comparison between Cantillon and Adam Smith. Cantillon said, the price is determined by agreement between the buyer and seller. And that's called the subjective theory of value. Adam Smith, on the other hand, says the price should be the labor cost to produce the water. And that's called the labor theory of value. Very consistent with Marxian thinking. Okay, now, Think of this last part. Suppose you have the Works Progress Administration, we're in the New Deal, and they come up with a scheme because they want they want to pump money into the economy. And they say, okay, you fellas get over here and dig holes. So they dig holes, that's costly. You know, they're gonna be paid at the end of the week. So they dig these holes and the next week fill them up. How much wealth have you produced? I mean, obviously, Adam Smith had it wrong. Okay, now it really gets interesting, I think, to me at least. And that is the Atlantic slave trade, which is a part of this, and Adam Smith's uh, understanding of it. Here's Adam Smith. Some particular branches of commerce, which are carried on with barbers and uncivilized nations, require extraordinary protection. An ordinary store or counting house could give little security to the goods of merchants who trade to the western coast of Africa. What were they trading? Slaves. <laughs> to defend them from the barbarous natives, it is necessary that the place where they are de deposited should be in some measure fortified. Does that sound like Kipling, the white man's burden? This is where it all started. This is the theory, theoretical basis for colonialism and imperialism. Okay, let's switch. I know we're going from place to place, but you know this is 300 years of history, and that's history is messy. Well, let's go to the French Revolution. But this tale has a main theme, and the, the longer-term effects of the French Revolution. Most of us know about the story of the steel. I think that's July 19th, the steel day, and how the steel was, was stormed, and that begins the French Revolution. Remember, they're in financially bad shape here in government. Part of that is helping the United States. And we're familiar with the execution of Queen Marie Antoinette and the beginning of, of the reign of terror. And ultimately, uh, how did that start? Well, they had their own paper money scheme and they just pumped the stuff out and what happens to prices? It went sky high. The washerwomen in <clears throat> Paris realized that they could no longer buy the soap that they needed and they were losing their source of uh, income. Who did they blame? They didn't blame the government for uh, running the printing press. They blamed the shopkeepers. And they, at first, just took what they needed. They stole the soap that they needed. And somebody said, well, you know, that's a really good idea. Why don't we take the sugar and uh, the coffee as well? And then they went further. You know, these people are oppressing us. The bourgeoisie, the shopkeepers, they're the ones who are responsible for our condition. And so they started to cart the shopkeepers off to the guillotine. 
and then it expanded and finally got to the whole aristocracy. And it ended up with Robespierre, who was behind the whole scheme, losing his head. And it finally it was over. That, of course, leads to Napoleon. And Napoleon, at first, is on the defensive side, defending the borders of uh, France. But ultimately, the revolution, the French Revolution, spills across the entire continent of uh, Europe. And there are three forces that come out of that. One is militarism, you know, the, the uh, Napoleon thing, uh, and non-Marxian socialism, non-violent socialism, liberalism. This is true liberalism. This is not the liberalism we talk about today. I noticed somebody shaking your head there. You understand. And then there's Marxian socialism. What? How big a force was this in 1848, which was another year of revolution? The Marxian socialists at that point have no weight whatsoever. I think there's something like 30 uh, tailors or some other occupation that meets somewhere in Europe. They have nothing to do with all of the, the revolutions that are occurring throughout Europe, but they made a lot of progress subsequent to that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Engels and Marx, um, not very much in depth. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit out of this, disregard that, throw that out of the court. Okay, we'll talk about what's happening to the central part of Europe, okay? And mainly in Germany, Germany and Austria, in the center here. Uh, these are little fiefdoms, you know, principalities, dukedoms, or whatever you call them. The very, very decentralized government. Germany is not a unified nation until 1870. But there's one force here that is starting to emerge, Prussia. Simultaneously, we have this fellow, Hegel. And this is the early 19th century now. And he has a philosophy of um, predetermined stages of history that he's con convinced um, that all of the world is on particularly Germany, because Germany is going to lead everything. And his philosophy is the state is all. The state is God's will. Okay? The individual has no role whatsoever. It's all about the state. Well, the Prussian monarchy, which was absolutist, said, we like this guy. He's, he's talking our language. So they create... They create... Um, I'm ahead of myself here. The Humboldt University of Berlin, which is the center of this philosophy. This is the state is all. And <clears throat> Bismarck looks over at this and says, okay, we've got the liberals. We don't like them. He, uh, Bismarck was a conservative, right? We don't like them. We don't like the liberals. We got we got to get rid of the liberals. We've got the socialists. We're going to have to we're going to have to work with them, tolerate them. So, Bismarck comes up with a program of a social safety net, which the world subsequently adopts. So you have this marriage of Prussian militarism and socialism is created. It's non-Marxian socialism at that point. Well, where do we get our PhDs in the late part of the 19th century? They are minted in that system of education, the German universities, based upon Hegel's philosophy. They come back and they, they're uh, concentrated in places like Johns Hopkins, Columbia, University of Wisconsin, and I think Harvard, Couple, a very, very small number of places, but they're very, very key in our educational system. That's where the progressive movement begins. And it ultimately leads to people like um, Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson becomes president of the United States in that critical year of 1913. And here's John Dewey. Now, John Dewey was an acknowledged socialist, but he's also the person who creates the 
the term, the new liberalism. When you talk about a liberal today, you're probably talking about, you know, that, that concept that he was, uh, that uh, uh, Dewey came up with, which is the new liberalism, somebody who believes in just the opposite of true liberalism. So you see how the terms have been switched around? There's a lot of that going on. And uh, in the book, I get into a lot of the, the uh, uh, discussion of labels and how they can be so misleading. Okay, chronologically, that positions us for World War I, and it was initially viewed as a party. Here are German uh, troops going to the, the front. They thought it would all be over in a month. And indeed, a month later, this is what they had and they lived for four years like that. Here's another link. We have Alessandro Mussolini, father, and Benito Mussolini. They are Marxian socialists. But there's a problem for Mussolini. If you're a Marxian socialist, you don't want to be involved in these world uh, Wars, which they viewed as you know, the, the elite nations, the uh, um, certainly not the, the proletariat fighting. And so they want to have nothing to do with it. That's the official Marxian position going into World War I. Mussolini looks at this and he says, I've got to change my tactics. And so he lines up Italy to fight with the, the alliance with Britain, France, and so forth, and Russia, and we create fascism out of that, that uh, experience. Now, we today think of Mussolini as being a real clown, a real dunce, but what we don't realize is that in the early years of that, uh, his, his realm, uh, a lot of people thought very highly of Mussolini. Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks Sr. I know this is before your time. These were people who were very important in the film industry in the silent years, I believe. But you'll recognize these two. They thought very highly of Mussolini. In the opposite direction, there's an event that occurs just after uh, World War I, which is totally ignored and forgotten, called the Forgotten Depression of 1921. The symptoms, the financial symptoms, were almost identical to the crash of 1929. And yet, this book describes how um, government does not become involved at all, and the free market is allowed to cure the situation, and it is completely cured in 18 months, and we go on to the Warring Twenties. 1936, you have uh, the general theory of John Maynard Keynes, and he comes back to what is now being called modern monetary theory. Have you heard that term? Yeah. Hey, what you have to do is print more money. And ultimately, the final triumph over liberalism is Adolf Hitler conquering Europe. And trust me, if you look into the life of Hitler and the, the times, there wasn't a liberal around in Germany. Every other group had their own militia. And that's why it was so chaotic in the 20s and 30s in uh, Germany. Um, let's talk about the printing of money and the, the increase in the money supply is the definition of inflation, by the way. When you go to the gas pump and you see that gas is a dollar, two dollars more than it was the year before, that's not inflation. That is what inflation has caused. It has caused an increase in the general price level. So where did we start off? 1720, John Law. Mississippi scheme. 1776, we had our own exposure to this. It ain't worth a continental. 
we were printing um, paper money as well. Fiat money, as we've seen, was a major cause of the reign of terror in the French Revolution. Again, we come back to paper money with greenbacks in our war between the states. 1921, we've got inflation in Weimar, Germany. 1922, we didn't talk about this, but the book does, uh, about how uh, Mussolini was printing money. 1936, Keynes comes up with the general theory, which is an excuse for printing money. 2008, the rescue of the US financial system. Again, we're doing it. 2020, Trump administration starts the stimulus. 2021, Biden administration continues the stimulus. It has nothing to do with party, has nothing to do with conservative versus progressive, let us say. Everybody is convinced this is the way to go. But as we have seen, it never works. All right, I'm going to conclude with one thought. Who gained from the stimulus payments in 2020 to 2021? Let's take a, a dollar that went into the individual stimulus program. <clears throat> This is a cartoon that comes from 1891. Now, I haven't been able to figure out whether that's an elephant or whether it's a donkey or whether it's a combination. I think it's both. But um, basically, the idea of paper money and, and uh, the, the lobbyists and all the rest of that, which is a part of mercantilism, all of that is, you know, comes out of our history as well. I've done a calculation for every dollar that went into an individual's pocket. Eight dollars went into special interests. Now, it's fascinating to me. I went and reached out to various organizations, particularly those um, that have a conservative orientation, so I figured they'd be interested in it. Nobody had that information. Finally, I went to uh, Wikipedia and looked up the overall uh, cost of the, the three legislative uh, uh, parts of this and simply subtracted what went into individuals' pockets, $8. So in other words, when you got that check, you figure you went into debt eight times what you received. Okay, let's conclude the, the tale here, where it began by having woven together hundreds of characters and events from history, and if there are lessons to be learned, they are these. Respect those who accept risk so that all humanity might gain. The entrepreneur. Entrepreneur takes on immense risk. Economic class is a vestige from the past, has no meaning to us today as modern people. Wealth is not created by printing money. That concludes the presentation. Questions? Yes, Dave. The, uh, the debt of the United States is 30 trillion and climbing. Um, 50 years ago, I guess I had my last finance class. And at that point, uh, the debt of the United States was explained as, well, these are treasury notes that you sell to individuals, maybe some organizations and government, and they took their surplus money that wasn't being used and you bought government bonds and the government would use the money to create infrastructure or battleships or whatever. Today you hear, well, the Federal Reserve bought, you know, 10 trillion in, in debt. They bought it with what? Where is this money that you know, used to come out of our pockets? We'd save it as a U.S. savings bond or something. Now it's it's bought by the Federal Reserve, and they the reporters will never tell you where did they get the money to buy these notes. So can you enlighten us, or what's your opinion? The, uh, the money comes out of thin air. It's simply 
created within the, the Federal Reserve System. Uh, the mechanism is very complicated. I'm not a banker, and I'm not your, your best source on that, but I, I know Ron Paul has really gotten into this in, in a big way. There is no question. There is no will behind that. Um, if you recall the Mississippi scheme, what was the wealth that was behind that? Um, there was several hundred uh, settlers in the Mississippi uh, area, and it turned out to be nothing whatsoever. So basically, if you look at that, 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 and then the uh, situation in the uh, South Sea bubble was similar in, in every one of these. Um, so what you're saying is, if I'm, I'm the Federal Reserve and I want to buy a trillion in bonds from you, I create on my books a, a phony asset and I use that asset. So if I was doing this in my private company, I'd probably be in jail with Bernie Madoff or something. Yeah. But, but this is what they do. They create an asset out of thin air and then they use that asset to buy. Any, anybody can do this, by the way. It's not, well, not everybody. You have to have a little bit of artistic talent. But if you've got enough artistic talent in a printing machine in your basement, you can do the same thing. It's called counterfeiting. Yes. In terms of the world economy, are, are there countries in the same boat? That we Absolutely. Have? Europe is in worse shape. Um, <clears throat> Japan is in bad shape. There are two nations I understand that are exceptions. And this is a little frightening. Russia and China. And both have done some of this, but they are starting to move away uh, from the, the money printing, accumulating gold and, and so forth. So if there is a worldwide crisis, relatively speaking, they will be better off. Now I say relatively because if we go into a world right, uh, worldwide crisis, uh, it's just like a world, you know, World War III. Everybody suffers with the exception of certain people, just like the schemes that we talked about here today. Any other questions? Well, you got us scared. <laughs> wow. the way Sorry out. to have ruined your day. <laughs> but think of it this way, spring is coming, you know, we've got beautiful weather, there is a positive side. I, I think we come out of this, by the way, if we understand what's what's going on. I think we come out of this positively. We're going to have to take some bitter medicine. We can go, uh, we can get through that and we'll be much, much better off. But really, if you think of the, the world that Cantillon was, was describing for us, it's a world of non-contention. This is a world where people trade with each other. Um, yes, there's competition, but there are rules. Um, and <clears throat> You move away from the political interventions, which ultimately lead to war. And you, you stay within the frame of expanding trade, expanding the, the skills that people have, the specialized skill. And that's what leads to human progress. And by the way, uh, I didn't get into the multiple realms of, of human action. Where does charity come from? Charity comes from just like profit uh, it's an excess, if you will, that a civilization is able to create. And that's, you know, if you're going to share the wealth, charity is the way to do it. But you've got to create the wealth first. Bill, you might be more optimistic than me. You pointed out that both the Trump and Biden administrations have their hand in this. And from what I can see, Neither political party is interested in, in stopping this gravy train. As, uh, so it doesn't matter really who's in power. You're going to keep doing this until it collapses. Is there a way out? We're, we're going to find out, I think, within the next several years. Uh, certainly, the, the two elections coming up uh, are going to be significant. We will see if there's a movement away from the old way of doing things politically towards what I've called real liberalism, um, which is, of course, 
minimum government. We're going to have to get the government out of the business, and we're going to have to get back to work. We can we can no longer subsidize people um, sitting at home. That's just one small part of it. But there is a law here that will be dominant over the long haul. It's called economic law. You can't flout economic law uh, forever. The chickens will come home to roost. Yes? What's the role of the entrepreneur in all this? You've sort of, sort of. Well, I'd invite you when you go home, as you go through the, the door, look at everything in your homes, the floor coverings, the windows, the electrical systems, the plumbing systems, the entire thing. Look at that and ask yourself, how many of these things exist because they came about automatically, if you will, by labor? And how much of this came about as a result of entrepreneurship? All of it. Entrepreneurship is the key to human progress. Okay, well, thank you very much, Phil. Thank you. When's your book coming out? Um, actually, the book uh, is in a review stage right now. It's available to anybody who's interested uh, at that uh, stage. And, uh, all they have to do is get in touch with me, and uh, I'll make yeah, sure that they get a copy. There's your email right there. Okay, thank you. I think next week our speaker is, uh, well, Craig, you, you can discuss that. <laughs> yeah. uh, next week we're going to try to have a program on sports and uh, why we love it and why we hate it today in a certain <laughs> in certain ways. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to begin. We're going to try to get uh, Jim Salisbury uh, also to participate. Uh, he's the uh, baseball writer for NBC Sports. And uh, uh, he's agreed to talk to us, but he's in spring training right now in Florida. So we have to figure out a way to get him to uh, come, <clears throat> come together with us through Zoom. But we're working on that, and uh, he'll be uh, the other part of the speaker. And uh, what we're going to try to uh, talk about is, is <clears throat> why do we love sports? How, how do we grow up loving sports? And what has happened to the uh, uh, sports today that uh, has uh, maybe uh, denigrated it to somewhat, uh, whether it's money or owners or whatever, but uh, we're both going to be speaking on that, that subject. And we'd also like you to participate too, um, um, to hear what you think of uh, what's happened to sports today. So uh, that's it. <laughs>